Thank you all very much for joining us uh, for our Talk Tuesday presentation on navigating high school for post-secondary success. Uh, and of course, when we're referring to post-secondary is life after ASD, post-high school. Uh, my name is Matt Beck. I'm one of the high school counselors here, and I'm joined uh, with most of the high school counseling department. So just as a reminder, this is the counseling team. There are six counselors in the high school. Uh, and then Miss Nancy Abusaid is our high school administrative assistant. First face that you see if you ever walk into our office. Uh, you'll be hearing from almost all of our counselors today. Unfortunately, uh, Miss Erin Tuesley has a sick child at home. We all know how that goes, and so she's gonna have to take him to the doctor today. But um, this is me, Matt Beck. Amanda Harvey is here. Mercy, Mercy Jessidas is here. Andrea Johnstone and Amy Thompson. So on the agenda for today, um, really focusing in, and by the way, before I, I start here, the way that we sort of advertised this uh, Talk Tuesday was uh, geared towards parents of grades nine and 10 students. So the information is primarily for that age range. However, if you have a grade 11 or 12 student, that's fine. The, the information is, is still applicable to you and, and maybe you can even chime in and offer some support throughout this presentation. Um, but really we're talking about grade nine and tens and growth and development that is taking place every day. Uh, the natural growth and, and development that takes place without us doing anything and then maybe where the school counselors, parents can, can support in that growth and development, all with the lens of the here and now and post-secondary post success. We have a, key, uh, a few uh, key focal points at each grade level that we want to highlight, not necessarily as uh, check boxes, things to do, but here are some significant things that you will encounter as grade nine and 10 parents. Uh, the importance of authenticity, students being who they are, allowing for them to discover their own sense of self and to allow for them to be the driving forces in their own lives. And that's easier said than done as parents. And we're gonna shift gears a little bit and start the conversation about post-secondary options or options for students beyond ASC. Okay, so there are a number of different options out there. We're gonna list the ones that are most popular um, and, and certainly the most popular option is university and college. Uh, after, after graduate. So we will start that conversation. Uh, we're going to go into our philosophy of what we call best fit. So not necessarily looking at one university and that's the one for me, but what is the right university for me based on all of these different factors that I've established that I want as a student uh, in my experience. And then finally we'll go into a little bit about uh, university requirements. Uh, those requirements vary throughout the world. Our students are going to universities throughout the world, and so we do touch on what are those different systems and what are those different universities looking for uh, in their applicants, okay? So we always start with the here and now, and all of this, when we're talking about university, really starts with students understanding who they are and experiencing growth now. Uh, we all want our students, our children, uh, to become well-adjusted young adults, capable of navigating the world on their own, overcoming adversity, working through life's challenges, because the reality is you're not always going to be there. We are not always going to be there by their side. So we really need to instill students with the skills uh, now so that they can be successful. Uh, the beautiful thing about ASD is the fact that we emphasize uh, the holistic approach to education. Uh, we don't only focus on the intellectual, right, the academics. We're looking at the whole child. So the personality development, uh, experiential, when we say experiential, we're talking about extracurricular activities, things outside of the classroom, and then of course the academic challenge and rigor that we bring here as well. So all of these things play a factor in finding our students' passions and establishing a best fit list of schools down the line. So starting with personal growth, I love this picture. 
Most of the growth that takes place uh, in, in students at this age uh, is sort of organic. It's not anything that we necessarily are doing or need to do, it's just living life through conversations with peers, uh, experiences in classrooms, experiencing adversity. That is just life. Um, at this stage, though, and really starting in grade eight and moving forward, we're really emphasizing, you've probably heard the term, of self-advocacy. There, uh, there is science behind it, okay? And so this is the point in time where parents, we hope, are sort of loosening the leash a little bit and allowing students to work through their own challenges, to advocate for, their self, for their, themselves uh, in personal challenges, academic challenges, and things of that nature, with coaching. Uh, and so as parents, certainly, we want you to help guide them. We want you to help uh, have the conversations with them ahead of time, but really stepping back and allowing for them to experience and work through their own challenges. Uh, because these experiences are what really builds sort of their Rolodex that they can refer to later on down the line, uh, having had these experiences. We want our students to build a sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is um, sort of the confidence that they feel to overcome challenges. If a student gets a C on an assessment, for example, one direction could be, I'm terrible at math, that's it, and, and I can't do anything better than that. This is, the C is who I am. We want our students to say, yes, I got the C, that's not representative of who I am, I know what I did wrong, and I can overcome this, and I can do it myself. And very often, we do see that shift take place early on in high school. Uh, and so, if you're noticing that your son or daughter is, is more in the first camp, you know, as a parent, we want to help them uh, build that sense of confidence, build that sense of self-efficacy, encourage them to advocate for themselves, talk to the teachers, talk to counselors, and then over time, build that sense of confidence. These are not things that happen overnight. And so, uh, but we can help really take these as learning opportunities uh, every time we have setbacks, which is the next bullet point there. Reflecting on that seat, what happened, did you cram the night before, or did you plan when you got that assignment? Uh, learning from maybe the mistakes that took place. Uh, even in, in discipline, you know, at, at ASD we don't have bad children, but there are certainly a lot of questionable decisions that are made, and that's very natural in, in high school. Uh, but it's how you learn from those decisions that is going to determine uh, how you're perceived or the percep perception of others. Um, students who make bad choices are sometimes the ones who have the most growth. Uh, and so those are, again, learning opportunities, but you have to be able to reflect on what went wrong so you can change it for the next time. Encourage effort, not perfectionism. Again, this is where parents can really, really help. This idea of learning orientation. When we say a learning orientation, it's students learning for the sake of learning not for that external motivator, grades, right? You're not learning because you want to get the A. You're learning because you want to learn. You're interested in the subject. And nine times out of 10, students who have a learning orientation as opposed to a results orientation, the grades tend to happen anyway because you're excited about it. Uh, and again, that's easier said than done, but as parents, we can sort of ask the questions we can allow for mistakes to happen and, and not necessarily focus in and you know, click on power school every second and obsess over that grade because that reinforces that results orientation. So learning orientation is something that we are striving to instill in our students here and certainly at the next level, that's what they want. Right? It's not all about the grade. Practicing life skills. This is an interesting one, particularly in Dubai. Uh, when seniors are getting ready to graduate from high school, uh, they, they kind of, some of them scoff because we, we put them through uh, cooking classes and how to do laundry and, you know, things that a lot of students are doing on a regular basis, maybe outside of this country, that very often our students are not exposed to. 
Uh, any opportunity that you can expose your sons and daughters to these real life experiences adds value down the line. Every year we have alumni who come back in December after their first semester in, uh, in university and they say, oh my gosh, that laundry lesson that you taught us <laughs> is that I know where the tide goes and I had to teach all the other international students how to do it. And so it's like, it's, it's a sense of pride. It's a sense of, I can do this. And so equipping them with those basic, what we think is basic skills really actually goes a long way. Um, in, in the cafeteria, we supervise some of the lunch, uh, lunch times and students leave their trash around, right? And that's a perfect example of though they, some of them expect others to pick up after them. And by the way, that's not an ASD problem, that's a 14 year old problem, okay? Um, but I ask students, you know, can you pick up your trash please? And some of them say, uh, it's not mine, and they walk away. And then others say, oh, it's not mine, and they pick it up, and they clean it up. And so reinforcing the fact that this is something that is an expectation at home. Parents can model that behavior by doing it, and, and students are watching that, and they're seeing that, okay? Uh, and then make time for you. Life shouldn't be all about little Johnny or Sally, right? You need to be able to separate and make time for you. But again, always being conscious that you're modeling the behavior that you want to see in, in your children. So personal growth, intellectual growth, the curiosity piece, the academia, um, and nurturing curiosity. And I mentioned the best way to sort of nurture curiosity is to allow students, allow children to pave their own pathway, but also to create a safe environment for them to do so, right? They should feel comfortable making mistakes. Uh, I have students who are very, very stressed out because they feel that their parents are gonna react in a certain way because of the grade that they received, for example. Um, sometimes it's in their own mind and, and it's self-imposed, but creating that environment where it's okay to fail, uh, you know, or it's okay to make a mistake, really encourage, encourages that curiosity. Again, emphasizing the learning process, that's the learn orientation, learning for the sake of learning. We want students to embrace rigor and challenge. Um, and that's, that can sometimes be perceived as, well, I need to take all these difficult courses and, and sort of stretch myself uh, and balance. But that's not what we mean here. You know, rigor is gonna be different for every student. And so what's rigorous for your son or daughter could be very, very different from somebody else's. Uh, the idea though is to find that balance, uh, the appropriate amount of rigor, uh, and then to balance that academic rigor with whatever else is happening in, in the child's life. So maybe it is withholding that super hard class and taking uh, the on-level class so that we can do all of these other things and do the fun. Rigor also is not necessarily APs. I'm gonna come out and say the, the AP word. It's not APs. Uh, rigor by, in our office, is if we have a graduation requirement of, of two languages, uh, maybe your son or daughter chooses to take three or four. They continue. So it's not just doing the minimum uh, or taking four maths instead of three. So it's extending and going beyond. Showing consistency is also rigor. Uh, so as course selection comes up, these are the conversations that we're going to start having with your sons and daughters and hopefully you as well as part of that conversation. And then we want to encourage reasoning. Uh, one thing that we've known that's been a huge shift in sort of the admissions, college admissions uh, process is, particularly in, in, in US admissions, they're not looking for regurgitation, brain in the seat, and uh, this is what I know, and I can't explain it, it's just I know it. Uh, universities are looking more and more for diversity of thought. They're looking for students who can come and be contributors in conversations contributors in dorm room conversations. Uh, and so understanding uh, and being able to think outside of the box, develop your own ideas, your own thoughts about an issue uh, is something that is highly, highly sought after and, and comes through in not only ASD classes, but also in, uh, in your applications later on as well. So how can parents help 
engage their children uh, in intellectual curiosity. These are real examples of what parents and students have done in the past. Uh, you have a captive audience. If you drive your son or daughter to school, they can't, they can't escape. <laughs> Lock the door and turn on a podcast. Uh, let them choose. Uh, and, and even if it's not you know, news or specific to academia, there's still a number of different things that you can talk about, you can discuss, uh, and that does two things. It, it stimulates the mind, but it also uh, strengthens the relationship if you have that, that thing in common. Uh, daily or weekly family reading time. You know, you could read a book together and discuss it. One of the things that actually we, we've started doing here, which I really liked, is we have this, it's called professional share. And so before, before meetings, one person uh, from the meeting will bring in a small, short little article and we'll all talk about it together. And it's separate from our agenda, whatever we're there to talk about, but it's something that's happening in the world, something new in education, uh, and it, it just brings us together for that moment. Very, very short, 10 minutes, something to think about. You can watch the news, ask for their opinion, get them thinking, let them speak, even though you may know something else. It's interesting to see their per perception of the world, of life events that are happening, you know, sort of outside of their world here at ASD. You can watch a movie together, talk about characters. This is a risky one. Watch uh, a Netflix show that they've been watching. Uh, but all possible options to really stimulate their, their curiosity and to show them that you care about what they're, what they're learning and what they're interested in. Okay. So on to experiential growth, Ms. Thompson. Good morning. Settle in for a bit because you're with me for a few slides. I apologize. Um, we're going to go ahead and start talking about experiential growth. As Mr. Beck said um, previously, this refers to extracurricular activities. I feel like this gives some of my students a bit of anxiety sometimes because they hear all these stories about how they should be doing certain things to get into certain schools, um, such as they need to have three sports and they need to be um, in community service and they need to have an internship and they need to take a summer program whatnot. There is no secret formula to this and all universities are looking for something different. Um, what they want is they want a unique student. They want somebody who is themselves, who has created passions and interests that they actually want to be involved in and that they can speak to when they're actually filling out their applications and they're filling out their essays and they're having their, um, in their interviews with these um, college reps. Um, I think um, what we really want kids to do is to explore. So in grades nine and 10, this is the time that they should be doing that, figuring out what they really are interested in and kind of seeing what they might want to continue with throughout their four years of high school. Um, and some of these things don't make sense to us. So as adults, we might say, why does my, why does my student or my child want to be involved in gaming, or why are they doing these weird magic tricks? I actually had a student that <laughs> did magic tricks and he was really good at it. Um, or why are they involved in baking? We don't bake at home, we don't do anything like that. So we might not understand why they're doing what they're doing, but it's really the time for them to cultivate and, and get an idea of what it is they're, they're wanting to do. Um, and it might not just stay in their high school career, it might be something that they want to do later on in their in their adult life. Um, uniqueness is a good thing. Like, like I said earlier, universities are looking for something different all the time. We never know what they're looking for in their students, but they want a diverse student body. So anything that your son or daughter can do that makes them stand out a bit um, and makes them unique is a good thing. And the main thing with this, this is what I try to tell my students all the time, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. They should be doing things that they really, really love to do, not just to check a box, saying that they've done it for their applications to university. Um, the other thing that's really important too is the amount of time that they spend in these, in these activities. So if, you're, if your son or daughter is, let's say, involved in a sport and they start in ninth grade and they really love it and they continue through 
um, their senior year. That's great. That shows that they have tenacity, they have stick to itness, if you want to say that, grit, um, and just uh, persistence. So that's something that's, that universities really like to see is that um, someone has stuck with something. If they're in the student government and they've done that all four years or even three years, because maybe grade nine they didn't get involved in that, but in grade 10 they did and they really loved it and they um, stuck with that and they decided to run for a leadership position. Those sorts of things are really important, um, but only if they love it. It shouldn't be something that they are kind of forced to do or told that they need to do in order to have um, this, this, um, this box checked on their application. So these are some of the things that our students have done in the past. I'll let you take a look at those for a minute. Um, I thought some of these were really interesting. We have a lot of students who like to do things on YouTube. <laughs> they don't have to do things on YouTube, but if they have something they want to share with not just the community, but you know the wider um, the wider community, um, that's something that you know they can actually show. They can show that in an application as well. They can have a link to their YouTube videos, and they can share that with the reps who come here. Um, blogging, blogging, lots of our kids like to write. Um, a lot of them like to get involved in um, political issues. Um, you know, it really just depends on what your child or your student is, is interested in, and you can encourage that. Um, avid hikers, they organize classes or hikes for other people. It really runs the gamut. It doesn't have to be something that is um, run of the mill. So just some ideas for you and your son or daughter. Okay, so some of the suggestions, and Mr. Beck talked about this before as well, these are suggestions. Um, it's, it's things that we do want our, our students to do, but at the same time, it's, um, you know, it's not an actual, it doesn't have to be done at a certain time. Um, over the grades nine and 10, they'll do a lot of these things, they'll just kind of build upon each other. Um, so study skills and work habits, this is a big one for grade nines. Um, a lot of them come up from middle school. They don't really know how to manage their time. They don't know how um, to figure out their study um, work habits. How long do they need? How, how do they time themselves? How do they um, you know, situate what class is more important on what day um, so that they can study for a test? They need to learn those study and work habits right now. We can all help them um, to figure this out. And if they do need help, counselors are here to help with that as well. If you feel like your, your student is not getting it um, and they're in grade nine, uh, that is the time that they really need to understand how to be successful for the rest of their, their four years in high school. Set personal goals. This is a big one, I think. It doesn't need to be goals for their whole four years of high school. It really just needs to be what is their goal for that year? What do they want to do? Do they want to be involved in the sport? Do they want to be involved in community service? What is it that they're wanting to kind of explore and get into this year? Um, because I think if we set too many uh, things for the future, they get a little overwhelmed with that. Um, building relationships. This is an important one too. Building relationships, not only with their classmates, which is a very important thing for, for high schoolers, as we all know. They need to have their friend group. They need to have people they can lean on but also starting to talk to their teachers, starting to talk to their counselors. Sometimes they're reluctant to come in and speak to the counselor because they think, oh my gosh, what am I, what do I need to go talk to a counselor for? But really just, um, you know, they, I have students that come in and just say hello to me. Hello, I had a great weekend. I just wanted to tell you what happened. I had a sporting event or I was, you know, I did uh, a cleanup for community service. Things like that just builds those relationships that continue over those four years. Again, explore extracurricular interests. They can do a few things, you know, grade nine, figure out what they really like to do, things that they really don't like to do, and so they can, you know, figure out better for the next three years after that what they're gonna stick with and be involved in. Parent-teacher conferences. Yes, your child or student, they should come to parent-teacher conferences. I know that they probably don't want to. Um, it's not how they wanna spend their time but it is really important for them to have a voice. Um, it's a perfect time also to have mom, dad, and teacher in the same space. 
so that they can voice what they want to um, want, want their parents to know about this class and what's happening within that class. So it's really important for them to, to be involved in that. PSAT 9, so all the grade nines will take the PSAT. And remember, this is a pre preliminary um, test, which is a practice test. So it's a really good time for them to gauge how well they think they would do on that test once they really do take the SAT. Um, it helps them with time management because it is a, a timed test. Um, and then they can um, review all of the um, all of their questions that they had to, to take. They get that back with um, their answers that were correct and the ones that weren't correct. And then they can see how well they have done on that and then prepare for the future tests that they will be taking. Um, four year planning. So don't want to get them too overwhelmed with four year planning, but it is something that they need to start thinking about. So what they would what we would like for them to do is come in and speak with the counselor um, about what their plan is for that year and what they see for the future but it doesn't have to be so intensive i really think that grade nine is one of those years that we don't want to overwhelm our students oh we have to start thinking about university right now no they don't they don't need to do that they just need to be exploring they need to think about the classes that they're taking right now that they really like maybe they really love social studies and they want to continue down that track right so um, just come in and have a conversation with their counselor explore summer opportunities this was not available the last few years because of covid lots of summer opportunities were not there but they're back they're coming back full force um, maybe they want to do an online program, uh, a course through one of the universities they're interested in. Maybe they want to go to a camp. Maybe they want to um, have an internship. Even grade nines can have internships. Um, maybe mom and dad have an internship at their, at their um, place of work. So things like that, that they can do that kind of help them understand what they are going to be interested in. And it really does help with careers as well. Um, maybe they think they want to be an attorney and they go and they spend some time in a law office and they say nope not for me or maybe it's really for them so um, it's really good for them to have those sorts of um, opportunities to help think through that grade 10 again you will they will continue with their extracurricular activities but at this point they're going to really kind of start narrowing it down um, what do I like? Did I like being in the gardening club? Did I like to, um, you know, play on such and such team? What do I really want to focus on over the next three years and really be involved and maybe have some leadership um, positions in that? PSAT will be taken again, um, which is really great because they, the more practice they have, the better. Um, SAT, not everybody will take that and they won't all need it for their universities because as we know now, um, a lot of the universities aren't really needing the SAT. However, some of them are starting to need it again. So um, it is really important that they have practice for the actual SAT when they, when they start taking that in um, late grade 11. Um, Parent-teacher conferences again, we want them to be involved. Um, and this is a great time for them to talk to their teachers and parents together because they will start um, thinking about their grade 11 classes, um, which will include, for some, APs. Um, so it's a good time for them to see where their teachers think they are in those classes and how well they're doing, or maybe not doing so well, right? I, again, identify areas of interest. What are they, what are they thinking they might want to study at this point? What are they wanting to be more involved in? Um, and, um, and then begin university exploration. So let's kind of go hand in hand. When you're thinking about your high school classes um, and you're thinking about university, you're going to want to see what kind of classes in grade 11 you're going to take because, and we'll get into this in a, in a bit, um, when you're thinking about your four-year plan and you're sitting there with your counselor um, and maybe with your teacher talking about your um, choices of classes, you're going to want to consider your post-secondary planning. Um, this is mainly for students who are probably going to study outside of the U.S., um, depending on what countries their universities that they're applying to are in. They, are, they may possibly need some sort of math class or um, science class that needs a lab, um, different things like that, but it really is country-specific. 
So if your child or student knows where they might be going, let's say they know they're going to go to Germany, they're going to need to they're going to need to take certain classes, and that and we can help them figure that out. Okay. But that really is for students who will be studying outside of the U.S. Um, hi, I'm Mercy. Nice to see all of you. Um, so we kind of gave you guys a little bit of like a foundation for how we approach the students and when we have conversations with them about high school and college planning. That is very holistic. So we wanted to give you guys some examples of how we've seen some of our um, successful students, how the four-year experience has kind of played out for them. Now they're all in university. Um, and these are students who really just pursued who they were. There was no packaging, there was no prodding, there was no insisting, it was just, what do you love? You've tried a few different things, pick one thing, hone in on it, and go for it. And these are some of the profiles we wanted to share with you of our graduates uh, from ASD. Uh, the first student profile is of a student who is really interested in um, hospitality and sustainability. That was a big part of uh, the students value profile, their personal profile, as well as their academic profile. So the hospitality piece is obviously very much kind of management, business related. The sustainability piece is they had opportunities at school with the school garden to pursue with food revolution. They like cooking. They're also involved in other um, performing arts was a niche area they were interested in and pursued that to uh, all four years in every capacity and every opportunity to have. Those were kind of their two big pillars that they focused on. And this student was very successful, uh, ended up at a very selective hospitality program uh, in their senior year following that, still there. So these are graduates of ASD. And we just wanted to give you guys some examples of students who didn't do a ton of things. They just picked one or two things um, and really focused on that. The second one is if a student really loved um, sports. What brought them <laughs> to sports was probably starting off in something like Dubai Little League themselves as a kid, but eventually over time it was building community, it was coaching. The student not only played sport, eventually ended up coaching because including others, including the younger kids, encouraging and mentoring them was really important to this individual. Was um, was a mini Falcons coach as well, was on our softball team. I'm trying to keep this as anonymous as possible, we gave away the gender there. Was on our <laughs> softball team um, <laughs> as well, all four years. And maybe they didn't start on varsity. Maybe they, the first year, maybe they didn't get as much play time as they thought or expected, but they stuck with it. It was that, I love this, I'm gonna keep with it, no matter what, I, I'm here to do this for community, the other parts in my value and personal profile that fit this experience, I'm going to stick with this and I'm going to continue. And there's really kind of built their, I don't like saying this, but kind of built their brand around that really. I don't, I don't like saying our kids were branded, but that was their, that was their area of focus that um, they honed in on. Um, and this student academically loved everything in sciences, uh, everything to do with um, sports, so like her kinesiology classes, or PE classes, the uh, anatomy classes, everything that science was PE offered that helped them build this profile, took all the right kind of classes, um, which they eventually only figured out over time, is currently in a selective nursing program, um, which is rare like out of under, uh, high school students are selected for nursing programs without any prior professional or pre-professional experience. Um, so this is also a very successful story of one of our graduates. The third one I'd like to share is of a student who, um, I'm going to start with kind of second to last bullet point. Equity and service was their guiding principle all through high school. And I'm sure it didn't start off with the mindset that I'm going to be president of XYZ Club, although that's where they ended up. Uh, it really started with um, kind of understanding early on. If the, the kids who were, the students who were in here earlier, GIA, um, the GIA students, that class, Global Issues and Actions, explores a lot of these values and how they apply to social issues in the world. 
politics and students pick the area they these students probably pick sustainability they pick the area they want to work on they're not given a topic um, and equity and access to education and healthcare was really um, a key area the student always uh, talked about and focused on and that was something near and dear to their heart and wanted to continue to explore that thought and was in that mindset chances are equity in healthcare is not something they're going to be able to dive into as a high schooler but looked at options here at school i don't know if you if you parents are aware our students teach um, english to some of our um, al Shrawi staff here to help them find better work opportunities so was it part of the club that does that you eventually started other additional services for those uh, for our staff members as well and really kind of worked on creating community amongst them this kind of helped develop that mindset of equity um, which really applied to healthcare especially for women I know the students it was mine was especially for healthcare that was really important to them for equity and uh, access for healthcare for women and the education that women received around the world and um, what was accessible or not accessible to them um, this was what got them up and got them excited for school. Yes, they took all the right math and science classes. That's related to health science and STEM. Um, and it's currently in a joint bed program. But the classes alone wouldn't have done it. The, the values alone wouldn't have done it. It's really kind of they found, all three of these students kind of found that perfect intersection of their personal profile, their academic profile, and the activities. And that all came together in a way that um, was true and authentic to them. And it just happened naturally over time. We wanted to share those examples with you guys because we wanted you to maybe think about what are your hopes for your child through this experience and what would you like for them to experience in high school, so if you can past high school. So what do you hope their college, university, or just when they leave ASD, what is that experience, what do you want that to look like for them? Um, in the within the framework of what we discussed today, like in terms of holistically, what do you want to, to look like? Do we want to share out or turn and talk? We're a pretty small group. <laughs> turn and talk. <laughs> We're small, but talk. Oh, go ahead. Ask a quick question. Yes. So there are the ASD core values that the students learn about. They dive into and they frame their behaviors as community members mm -hmm. through. Do you additionally then explore values so that students are identifying selected values and then using those values to reach out through their actions in the world? Like yes. you did in that third student profile. Is that something that every student here is asked to ponder and articulate? Yes, we do that uh, with our 11th graders when we start the college kind of research piece. So what's one of the things that we have to do is the BIA character inventory. Um, that also helps them kind of, it also helps them start to understand a little bit of self-awareness before they start writing their essays and before they start meeting with us um, in their junior year for college meetings. Because that kind of guides us through uh, how we advise them as they go into planning for actual applications of their school. But it's interesting because via our character strengths, they're an inventory of character strengths, whereas equity and service are values that are, you know, fitting within a separate frame. But we can put that on the shelf on the side. I was just curious to see that language in that third student profile and how that was cited, so I wanted to understand. Thank you. Yeah. How about turn and talk? I think we're a bit <laughs> shy today. <laughs> okay. Um, when do you start meeting with the juniors? What part of time in the Year. Time frame. So juniors, we uh, start with. In, we've already had a first big group meeting with them. We start in the fall, in October. October. Yeah. PSAT day. Yeah. PSAT day. That's right. October. So after PSATs, we have to audience with them in the theater. We have them for the rest of the afternoon. Um, that's our first kind of kickoff. It's um, a lot of. It's very experiential. It's a lot of activities. A lot. Of, um, Games and discussion really to get the the wheels turning. Um, 
it's not heavy on here's what you need to start doing for applications because it's just too early to start that. Um, second semester, we will start meeting with them one on one. Typically, we start. We don't even wait until the start of the end of the semester. The start of the semester, we want to come back for winter break um, once the kids are kind of settled in. We see what their class schedules are like. There's usually a lot of summatives at that time because the semester is wrapping up. But we have students' availability, so we'll start meeting with them. But over the course of this, uh, the next few months, we meet with them in advisory um, a couple of times before winter break. There are a few more um, action items, surveys, and things that they need to do. We introduce them to see how we can use it for college research. So that will be an advisory. And then we'll start the one on one meetings. Once the one on one meeting is done, that's just the start. We initiate those from our office, but after that, they have the rest of the semester to come in and meet with us as many times as they like. Because before summer, we'd like them to have all the information they need to build a list and finish as much of their college as possible over the summer. So the fall of some years. I jumped ahead two years. This is really <laughs> for nine and ten, but I hope that. Um, so here are some just some statements that you can reflect on independently. Um, we're going to take you through three different sets of statements. And the first set of statements talk about what are, um, what are different reasons students go to school. Um, and the first set of statements talk about um, like the life experience at school. Um, what is the student, if the student or a family <laughs> choosing university because they are seeking um, a certain four-year experience or three-year experience. It's um, not necessarily about what will they exactly study or what the job they'll work after that, but it's those four years, the personal development that comes with it, the creating relationships, it's exploring other backgrounds, learning about people you may have never met, uh, we're very homogenous in school here in Dubai, and that's the case for most international kids. We're very diverse in the number of passports and cultures represented, but in many ways our students um, may not be exposed to students who come from families where um, they have to have a job to um, stay in college. Um, that might be something new on their floor. They might have a roommate who has to work on campus and that might be something new that they're exposed to. Um, so some students look at university as this is a life experience, and this is what I hope to do, is understand how the world works for other people, how can I engage with it, what can I get involved in, how can I build relationships, whether with peers or with uh, professors or other graduate students on campus. It's those connections and those experiences in those four years that they're looking for. So think about uh, these bullet points and reflect on a scale of one to five, five being strongly agree, one being strongly disagree. How much does this resonate with you as, this is why I want my child to go to school? Think about how you might answer this, and think about how your child might answer this. So this is one set of values. Another set of values that students and families look at when they're looking at university is um, it's very uh, it's very linear. There's a very clear goal. Uh, it's for a set of skills. It's for a particular vocation or career. Um, it's to gain those experience and skills to get X, Y, Z job. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's also just a different set of values. So think about how much this might resonate with you on this scale and how your child might feel. And the third set of values we can look at is um, students and families have the perspective of university is about having a um, very specific experience that will help embellish my um, my resume, or it will give me opportunity for um, 
to set myself up for future success because I've, I've attended XYZ University. Um, it might be the quality of the school, maybe the ranking, um, or the cost, the, rate, uh, the return on the cost for the education that you're getting there, or to maybe for some of your students, for you, it might be uh, earning potential, graduating from that school. So there is a very specific goal that's either related to prestige or finances um, that the student is looking at when they are, or the family is looking at when they're approaching this. These are also another set of values that some students, that's really important to them. For some families, that's really important to them. And for some, maybe less so or neutral. One of the things that we ask our students to do during um, junior meetings as well is to kind of reflect on these values. What are you looking for from the college experience? Um, a resource that we use that I recommend, especially if you have a 10th grader later in the year, not right now, um, is this book called College Match. And this is, a, this is a, a really awesome resource. It just guides students through a lot of self-reflection um, like these statements on why do you want to, what does you want in the college experience? Why do you want to go? What do you already have that makes you an asset? And um, what kind of environment would be the best fit for you? This book is written by, uh, I believe, a former counselor. His name is Steve Antonoff. We have a few copies in our office. Students come by and use it during lunch. We don't check these out because we don't have a checkout system like the library, but the students can come use it in our office. These uh, bullet points are from one of the surveys that Steve has in his book. He has several in his book, and his surveys are on his website for free as well. And if you have a 10th grader over the summer, before 11th grade, if you want to pull up one of the surveys um, on either values or personal profile, and how your personal profile, what kind of qualities would be, um, university qualities would be the best fit for you, you can do that with your child. It could be a conversation. And sometimes students are intimidated by answering something that you print out. And it could just be a conversation. You could read through it yourself first and just like, hey, let's just talk about this and throw out some talking points and see how they feel and then have conversations. But they could do this independently as well. Um, it is kind of structured for students to go through with worksheets. You'll see like with worksheets, and they can kind of do it independently themselves as well. This is one resource I'd like to introduce you guys to, and these are directly from Steve's book. So I'm going to hand it off to Andrea, and she's going to talk about post-secondary options. Hi, uh, welcome, and I apologize. I'm going to be talking and then running because I do have a meeting with a junior, but so I don't want to. Uh, keep her waiting too long, but I'll let her wait for a few minutes. Um, so this is sort of what our students are doing at ASD, right? So 96% of our students and your children are heading off to university. Um, they're doing that across the, the world, with that majority going to North America. So the most of them are going to the US and then to Canada, and we'll get to that in a minute. You'll see the, the spread of, of the globe. But 96% are heading off to university, so that preparation for um, that is why we're here today, talking about you know, doing school well, finding what you're interested in, um, exploring those things. Some students don't go directly. They're going to do things like a gap year. And gap years can actually be the internships, work, travel, exploration, trying to figure out a little bit about who they are so when they land at that school that they're, they're attending, they can really take advantage of everything that's there. There's a lot of great statistics um, and research that's been done on students who do gap years and their success in college. Colleges like students who take gap years. They grow. They become much more guess, introspective and understand why they're going to college, right? So the Antonoff book asks that question, why? Like, why do we all go to school? Why do we expect this of our children? I mean, it's a question we should examine ourselves and our students should examine. And that gap year can help do that and then really help them focus. So it's a very positive thing, but it's not for everyone. There are lots of programs you can buy into, you can create your own, etc. Internships, work experiences, again, that exploration of self, 
um, travel. We come from a place where lots of us have that opportunity to travel and that gives us that global experience, but not everyone has had that. So again, or maybe they have enough to travel where they want to. Sorry, I'm talking really fast because I know I have this meeting. Slow down. Um, we have some students who go into the military, either because it's compulsory or because they want to. Um, and then, like I said, the vast majority are going on to university. This is where our students at ASD have gone in the last five years. So this is the percentage. So, so you can see most are heading to North America, the majority heading to the US and then Canada. Um, we have a growing population heading to the UK. I think we're seeing that grow each year, um, as well as Europe. And then other parts of the, the globe here, a few, you know, uh, a handful over the last five years. I think we're seeing um, growth in Canada, UK, Europe for finances. As we know, US is extremely expensive. It's not everyone's choice. US has some other um, things that maybe people are moving away from, and that's okay. We can support your student across the globe in our office. Again, starting that academic advising that we're doing in ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade to help them see their path, where they need to, where they need to focus their academics here to make these options available. And we try to keep all of these options open, right, as they're trying to decide. But it's an important part of your family conversation as to where in the world you expect your child to go or where they have the opportunity to go so that they know sort of what they need to do to plan here um, for those different opportunities. Because you'll see a little bit later, you know, the entrance requirements can vary. All right. Best fit. We've heard a lot about that today. I think everyone has talked about it at some level, and that best fit is knowing who you are. So we start with the person, right? Who is your child? Who are they? They're gonna explore that at school. They're gonna explore that in those conversations with you. They're gonna do lots of things in college match, start asking themselves questions. We're gonna throw some inventory about them where they can explore and again talk with each other. Who are they? What's important to them? And how does that work into fit for university? What kind of program do they want to study? What are they interested in? What do they like to study now? If they don't like science now, setting them down the path or medical route where they're going to be taking hardcore science and math maybe isn't the right thing. Maybe they're not interested in being a doctor. Maybe they really love social studies. We need to figure out how does that play into future careers. But what do they want to study? Um, every degree that we have, and we could probably you know, survey this room and got, most of us aren't working in the degree that we earned, right? We have transferable skills, things that we can take across. We've learned how to learn when we went to university. So again, that program might be very well known. A kid might know they want to be an engineer or they want to be a doctor or a lawyer, <coughs> or they might not know. And they're going to that liberal arts experience they're going to explore and they're going to come out with transferable skills in like business or finance or medicine still, who knows? or jobs that just don't exist right now. People, we're talking about fit, we're also talking about who you are with, right? So do you want to land in a school that's really small? Do you want to be in a large place? Do you want to be with students of, of great diversity? Do you want to be, you know, like who do you want to be with? You're gonna be with them for four years, not just in the classroom where you're maybe spending 20% of your time, but also in the dorms, in the, in the cafeteria, in the sporting fields, watching games. Who are those people you want to be surrounded with and the people that you want to make connections with, right? Because they're the people that you're going to probably have lifetime friendships with and network and um, work experience. They're going to be in your life, in your life forever. Um, price. This is one that I want parents to talk about early with students. What are you willing to invest? What are you able to invest? and be honest with yourself, right? That might decide where you're going in the world. Are you following your passport, or are you going to go beyond that? Um, so the price conversation is something that, at least at the adult level right now in 910, you might want to start talking about how are we financing university, and what's that going to mean for our, our child down the road for choice. When they start researching in junior year, they should know what that, what that investment is, what, what's possible for the family. They don't need to know your down and dirty finances, but they should know, you know, what's what's what you're willing to invest on this this uh, experience. Outcomes. What's important for that student again? What are they going to get from that university? What are they going to be able to access and to take with them? What sort of job are they looking for? Where do they want to live? If you go to the school in the states, 
chances are most of the people there, or at least initially, those first five years, you're going to live in the States and work. That's where your connections are going to be. You go to the UK, you're going to work in the UK. So where do you want to be after university? So outcomes both for work, for jobs, for opportunities, and just for the world. We get more, you know, um, what's the word I want? Uh, transient as we get older, right? But as we build skills and build those networks, we have an easier time going across continents. In place, I think we've talked about that a little bit already. Where in the world <laughs> do you want to be? Finding all of these things and having them intersect is going to find those schools, not one school, but many schools that can be a best fit, right? There's not just one place to go. There's many, but they should fit all of these different pieces and then putting the value, as Ms. Mercy was saying, where your values land might um, prioritize which ones are more, more important. Um, price might be most important or place might be most important, but each one has some level of, uh, of space. Okay, spectrum of curriculum. Another thing about fit, we'll have students who will apply to the UK and to the US. Sometimes that feels a little odd, right? The US, you have an opportunity to explore um, these sort of that broad, flexible um, curriculum where you have one to two years to explore your interests before you declare a major. And you can take things across all kinds of disciplines. Whereas over here in UK and Ireland, um, most European universities, some exceptions, and the research universities in the Netherlands are three-year degrees. You need to know what you're going to study. You're applying for that course, and that's what your degree is in three years later. Right? You get right into it right away. So for students who really know what they want to do, this can be a great option. For students who have no idea what they want to do, this doesn't make sense, right? They don't have that time to explore. Now you're forcing the choice. And then we have these beautiful middle places, right? Some sort of, they come into, the, into that space where you have maybe a direction, a faculty that you apply to, or like in Canada, or where you, in Scotland, start out with three different courses, and that eventually one of those becomes your, your major of study. But you get, a, you, know, you get a little bit more time to explore, a little bit more flexibility, but with focus. So I guess I think of this one as sort of the unfocused, still exploring some interest areas, but not exactly where you want to be, and you know exactly what you want to do. So you need to fit, you know, when we're thinking about the world, where you fit into the world, where your child does as well. I'm running to my appointment. I'm so sorry. So I'll let someone else speak more slowly. And for a resource, this is a book that I also love. It's a great companion book to Antonox. So Rick Clark, who's the um, director of admissions at Georgia Tech, um, and a high school director, Brendan Bernard, wrote this. It's fantastic. It's going to give you another sort of a guide to staying together as a family and not making this bigger than it needs to be. So he'll tell you right up front, you don't need to hire someone. You can just read a couple of books, and you can do this, right? So, highly recommend both. And my apologies for running. Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, we're over time. I will be very quick. So, we just want to hone it down now. So, you know, there, there's the broad thing, then we're having family conversations about what is the student and um, what do they want. And when we talk about best fit, you know, the focus isn't on getting in. Our kids get into college. Relax, everyone. They will all get in. <laughs> It's, it's not getting in, it's staying in. It's getting into where they need to be. And once they're there, being successful and coming out in the end, you know, with life skills that they can take to the job market. As we know, is ever evolving, right? So, you know, high school is about the currency and, and how you're gonna spend that currency getting into college. So sometimes different colleges are looking for different things. So it does depend on the country that you're going to. And of course, if you know where you're heading, it's actually easier to kind of re-engineer that and say, okay, if you're going to the UK, you need five APs. Um, if you're going to the US or you're going to Canada, let's look at it in a different way, right? So that is part of the conversation as we're shaping the four-year plan. But as a caveat, as an American school, we're just going to go through the list of what American schools are looking for um, in a student. Now, this isn't to scare you, but to, to show you what is holistic admissions. So holistic admissions means that colleges are looking at 
a number of different factors. They're not just honing in on one thing. So yes, they're looking at their transcripts, they're looking at their GPA, they're looking at what courses they've done. But, it, but because they're looking at it holistically, a single grade is not going to kill an application. There are no deal breakers. So, you know, um, well, you know, maybe there might be some. But, yeah, we don't want really, really, we don't want fails. But, you know, a B in, in um, French in grade 10, we can live and we can move on from that. That's not going to be a deal breaker, right? But they're going to look at standardized test scores um, in various different ways. They're looking at the essay. So that is the student's voice in their application. They're looking at the teacher recommendation, the counselor recommendation, and, and that's where we're fleshing out um, what the student is like as a person in the classroom, in the school community, you know, what's their, their story, what's with their transcript, you know, what's their context, right? So it's all very qualitative. Um, we're also looking at their extracurricular activities, whatever that might be, it might be music for some. Um, it might be sport for others, so it's not going to be the same. Um, and for some applying to US colleges, they may have interviews with alumni. I mean, let's be honest, alumni interviews are really more about the alumni than the student. <laughs> but um, for our students that are um, eloquent and charming and interested and engaged, you know, they help the student actually make a decision about what is right for them, you know, as a customer. So, you know, we do encourage our students to have interviews and um, it helps them get to know, you know, what that experience is going to be like for them. Um, now, demonstrated interest is uh, interesting because some colleges will track the, the level of interest that a student has paid to that college. Now, they do that because what they're trying to work out is, if we offer you a place, are you going to come? Now, some um, some really consider that in the decision-making process because they, they want the yield, right? They want to give an offer and they want a good percentage of people that are going to turn up on the door. Um, and that's good for their ranking. So, you know, it's about students joining, um, like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm stuck now, like Instagram groups, you know, what young people do. They like, like things <laughs> and <laughs> do things. And, and, then, and then the colleges um, will send them emails and they'll track who opens that email, who scrolls down, who looks at the links. Um, if they're interested in a college and the college comes to school, then really they need to come and say hello because they'll track who's turned up. So for grade 9 and 10, it's not too early. You know, we've got hundreds of colleges coming through the door. You know, there, there's a lot now, there'll be a lot in March. You know, encourage your sons and daughters to have a look at who's coming and, and have a conversation with the rep. You know, often the reps that are here are the people that are reading applications and making um, admission decisions. So it is really important. Um, mostly so students can have the opportunity of that serendipitous conversation. I mean, we all know those conversations we've had in our life that have changed our thinking, changed our direction. You know, the more they have those conversations, the more chances there are that um, they're going to learn something new. So, um, you know, that sort of holistic admissions from a US point of view, but also, you know, some of these data points count for um, universities in other parts of the world. Um, now, this is the magic list. So, these are all the things you're worried about. These are all the things you think um, your children should do that they need to tick all of these. Um, and that is the, the straight line to success. It is not. There is not a checklist. There is not a straight line to success, you know. Um, do not kind of over schedule students or pressure them into doing something that isn't authentic for them. You know, what we're, what we're encouraging students is to lean in to what they're interested in, you know, and then develop and grow that interest over time. Now, it might be that some play sport, it might be that someone can't catch a ball. That's fine. Um, so, you know, it's not it's not that we're we're asking students to do all these things, just do the things, pick the things that are that speak to you. Now, this is the mystery over this side, the institutional needs. Now the institutional need in the US application is the way that the US say um, we're not going to tell you what we want. 
So you can never second guess what it is that they're looking for in that admission round, right? So admissional and institutional need might be legacy, it might be an athlete, um, it might be, you know, you play the cello, but this year they want a clarinetist. Um, so, you know, those things, you can't second guess that. So again, it's about authenticity in the process for the student, you know, finding the best fit for them, um, and then speaking of themselves authentic, authentically in their application. Um, because there's so many things that we don't know. Um, before, our students would benefit from the diversity that US colleges were looking for. So our students, international students, they were multilingual, they were well-traveled, they'd been in a diverse population. They were really attractive for US colleges. However, what we're seeing is that there's a slight shift and due to COVID, thank you COVID, um, colleges, US colleges are now looking for more um, economic diversity. So they're, now they're moving towards um, first generation college applicants, they're looking for more students who are um, from lower income families to kind of increase access. So, you know, that does affect our students because obviously our students don't fit that box. So, you know, sometimes there's board level decisions for admissions taking place at universities that we can't influence and we don't know. So that is the kind of institutional need and priority piece. So let's focus on what we can control, not the stuff we can't control, but also, you know, doing it in a meaningful, authentic way. Um, so I'll, I'll just carry on, I'll do it quickly. So this speaks to, to what I was talking about earlier about it's good to know, you know, what direction you're going in because it's very difficult to be all things to the whole world. Um, particularly when different university systems are looking for slightly different things. And, and what you want is um, your, your son and daughter to, to be the very best they can for wherever they're, hope, wherever they're you know, hoping to get to. So um, in Canada, um, they're, they're really focused on GPA. Actually, that's critical, and they, they don't care about um, grade nine, they don't look at grade nine. Um, really, they're focused on grade 11 GPA. So grade nine and 10 students have still got some time to get it together. Um, in the UK, they're really not interested in GPA. They're really looking at final AP scores, and that's it, really. In fact, they're not really interested in extracurricular either, to be honest. You know, they're interested in extracurricular because it contextualizes their grades, but they don't care whether it's softball or synchronized swimming, to be honest. Um, what they're interested in is how a student has really developed the love of their subject outside of the classroom, you know, supercurricular. So things that they've done, work experience, books they've read, you know, how they've dug down into their subject. Um, and then in, in the Europe, in, in Europe, it hurts me that they're separate. Um, <laughs> in, in Europe, it is mostly um, standardized testing. So it's APs or it's SATs. Um, so it is more specific and less holistic in, in different countries. But for now, <laughs> but for now, enjoy your children while you have them. Um, and, you know, I'm sure if you speak to senior mums, it goes so quick. So, um, you know, our kids get into university and they go and they're successful and they have a lovely time. Um, oh yeah, college is really great fun, isn't it? Do you remember? <laughs> you know, let, let's focus on, on all those great experiences. Um, and, you know, we're working in partnership with you to make, sh to make sure that your sons and daughters do well in high school and then do well when they leave school. So, <coughs> questions? <laughs> Does anyone have any comments or questions? This was very good. Thank very you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Yes. Thank uh, you. Apologies for running over. We get excited about this stuff. <laughs> but um, as a reminder, we are we are here. Please reach out to your counselor if you want to talk more about this. If you have specific questions about any of the content here, always happy to to have those conversations. Yeah. You can, on, on the school intranet, you can see our emails and there, there's also a link to our online calendars. So, um, you know, if you want to connect with us.
please, please uh, reach out. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.